Welcome to today's Triple Z. The Triple Z Podcast is a daily program that you can use to help you fall asleep each night. Just turn down the volume, lay back, relax, and enjoy as you fall asleep. The novel Kidnap follows the adventures of David Balfour, a young man who becomes entangled in political intrigue and danger after the death of his father. David is betrayed by his uncle, Ebenezer Balfour, who tries to have him kidnapped and sold into slavery in the American colonies. Fortunately, David manages to escape and embarks on a thrilling journey across the Scottish Highlands. During his journey, David encounters Alan Breck Stewart, a Jacobite outlaw and loyalist to the exiled King James II of England. Together, they face various challenges and dangers as they travel through the rugged landscape of Scotland. The novel is praised for its rich character development, atmospheric descriptions of Scotland, and engaging storyline, making it a classic in literature. If you enjoy our program, please be sure to write us a review on your podcast platform and share us with a friend. You both might sleep just a little better at night. Our website is triple Z, that's three Z's dot media. You can also like and share our content on Facebook or our Instagram account ZZZ Media Podcast. Music for today's episode was provided by the Sleep Channel on Spotify. Chapter 1 I set off upon my journey to the House of Shaws. I will begin this story of my adventures with a certain morning early in the month of June, the year of grace 1751, when I took the key for the last time out of the door of my father's house. The sun began to shine upon the summit of the hills as I went down the road, and by the time I had come as far as the manse, the blackbirds were whistling in the garden lilacs, and the mist that hung around the valley in the time of the dawn was beginning to arise and die away. Mr. Campbell, the minister of Ascendian, was waiting for me by the garden gate, good man. He asked me if I had breakfasted, and hearing that I lacked for nothing, he took my hand in both of his and clapped it kindly under his arm. Well, Davy, lad, said he, I will go with you as far as the fort to set you on the way. And we began to walk forward in silence. Are you sorry to leave us, Indian? said he, after a while. Why, sir, said I, if I knew where I was going, or what was likely to become of me, I would tell you candidly Ascendian is a good place indeed, and I have been very happy there, but then I have never been anywhere else. My father and mother, since they are both dead, I shall be no nearer to an Ascendian than in the kingdom of Hungary, and, to speak truth, if I thought I had a chance to better myself where I was going I would go with a good will. I said Mr. Campbell. Very well, Davy. Then it behoves me to tell your fortune, or so far as I may. When your mother was gone, and your father, the worthy Christian man, began to sicken for his end, he gave me in charge a certain letter, which he said was your inheritance. So soon, says he, as I am gone, and the house is rid up and the gear disposed of, all which, Davy, hath been done, give my boy this letter into his hand, and start him off to the house of Shaw's, not far from Cremant. That is the place I came from, he said, and it's where it befits that my boy should return. He is a steady lad, your father said, and a canny goer, and I doubt not he will come safe and be well liked where he goes. The house of Shaw's. I cried. What had my poor father to do with the house of Shaw's? Nay, said Mr. Campbell, who can tell that for a surety? But the name of that family, Davy, boy, is the name you bear Balfers of Shaw's, an ancient, honest, reputable house, peradventure in these latter days decayed. Your father, too, was a man of learning as befitted his position, no man more plausibly conducted school 
nor had he the manner or the speech of a common domine, but, as you will yourself remember, I took a pleasure to have him to the manse to meet the gentry, and those of my own house, Campbell of Kilrenet, Campbell of Dunswire, Campbell of Minch, and others, all well gentlemen, had pleasure in his society. Lastly, to put all the elements of this affair before you, here is the testamentary letter itself, superscribed by the own hand of our departed brother. He gave me the letter, which was addressed in these words, to the hands of Ebenezer Balfour, Esquire, of Shaw's, in his house of Shaw's, these will be delivered by my son, David Balfour. My heart was beating hard at this great prospect now suddenly opening before a lad of 17 years of age, the son of a poor country domine in the forest of Everick. Mr. Campbell, I stammered, and if you were in my shoes, would you go? Of a surety, said the minister, that would I, and without pause. A pretty lad like you should get to Crayman, which is near and by Edinburgh, in two days of walk. Yet the worst came to the worst, and your high relations, as I cannot but suppose them to be somewhat of your blood, should put you to the door, ye can but walk the two days back again and RISB at the man's door. But I would rather hope that ye shall be well received, as your poor father forecast for you, and for anything that I can come to be a great man in time. And here, Davy, laddie, he resumed, it lies near upon my conscience to improve this parting and set you on the right guard against the dangers of the world. Here he cast about for a comfortable seat, lighted on a big boulder under a birch by the track side, sat down upon it with a very long, serious upper lip, and the sun now shining in upon us between two peaks, put his pocket handkerchief over his cocked hat to shelter him. There, then, with uplifted forefinger, he first put me on my guard against a considerable number of heresies to which I had no temptation and urged upon me to be instant in my prayers and reading of the Bible. That done, he drew a picture of the great house that I was bound to and how I should conduct myself with its inhabitants. Be simple, Davy, in things immaterial, said he. Bear ye this in mind that, though gentle born, ye have had a country rearing. Dinny shame us, Davy, dinny shame us. In yon great muckle house, with all these domestics, upper and under, show yourself as nice, as circumspect, as quick at the conception, and as slow of speech as any. As for the laird, remember he's the laird. I say no more, honor to whom honor. It's a pleasure to obey a laird, or should be, to the young. Well, sir, said I, it may be, and I'll promise you I'll try to make it so. Why, very well said, replied Mr. Campbell, heartily. And now to come to the material, or to make a quibble, to the immaterial. I have here a little packet which contains four things. He tugged it as he spoke, and with some great difficulty from the skirt pocket of his coat. Of these four things, the first is your legal due, the little pickle money for your father's books and plenishing, which I have bought, as I have explained from the first, in the design of reselling at a profit to the incoming domini. The other three are gifties that Mrs. Campbell and myself would be blithe of your acceptance. The first, which is round, will likely please you best at the first off go, but, oh Davy, laddie, it's but a drop of water in the sea, it'll help you but a step and vanish like the morning. The second, which is flat and square and written upon, will stand by you through life, like a good staff for the road and a good pillow to your head in sickness. And as for the last, which is cubical, that'll see you, it's my prayerful wish, into a better land. With that he got upon his feet, took off his hat, and prayed a little while aloud, and in affecting terms, for a young man setting out into the world, then suddenly took me in his arms and embraced me very hard, then held me at arm's length, 
looking at me with his face all working with sorrow, and then whipped about, and crying goodbye to me, set off backward by the way that we had come at a sort of jogging run. It might have been laughable to another, but I was in no mind to laugh. I watched him as long as he was in sight, and he never stopped hurrying, nor once looked back. Then it came in upon my mind that this was all his sorrow at my departure, and my conscience smote me hard and fast, because I, for my part, was overjoyed to get away out of that quiet countryside and go to a great, busy house among rich and respected gentlefolk of my own name and blood. Davy, Davy, I thought, was ever seen such black ingratitude? Can you forget old favors and old friends at the mere whistle of a name? Fie, fie, think shame. And I sat down on the boulder the good man had just left and opened the parcel to see the nature of my gifts. That which he had called cubicle, I had never had much doubt of. Sure enough, it was a little Bible to carry in a plaid nook. That which he had called round, I found to be a shilling piece, and the third, which was to help me so wonderfully both in health and sickness all the days of my life, was a little piece of coarse yellow paper written upon thus in red ink. Teal make lily of the valley water, take the flowers of lily of the valley and distill them in sack, and drink a spoonful or two as there is occasion. It restores speech to those that have the dumb palsy. It is good against the gout, it comforts the heart and strengthens the memory, and the flowers, put into a glass, close stopped, and set into an ill of ants for a month, then take it out, and you will find a liquor which comes from the flowers, which keep in a vial, it is good, ill or well, and whether man or woman. And then, in the minister's own hand, was added. Likewise for sprains, rub it in, and for the colic, a great spoonful in the hour. To be sure, I laughed over this, but it was rather tremulous laughter, and I was glad to get my bundle on my staff's end and set out over the fort and up the hill upon the farther side, till, just as I came on the green drove road running wide through the heather, I took my last look of Kirkus Indian, the trees about the manse, and the big rowans in the kirkyard where my father and my mother lay. Chapter 2 I come to my journey's end. On the forenoon of the second day, coming to the top of a hill, I saw all the country fall away before me down to the sea, and in the midst of this descent, on a long ridge, the city of Edinburgh smoking like a kiln. There was a flag upon the castle, and ships moving were lying anchored in the firth, both of which, for as far away as they were, I could distinguish clearly and both brought my country heart into my mouth. Presently after, I came by a house where a shepherd lived and got a rough direction for the neighborhood of Cremant, and so, from one to another, worked my way to the westward of the capital by Colinton till I came out upon the Glasgow Road. And there, to my great pleasure and wonder, I beheld a regiment marching to the fifes, every foot in time, an old red-faced general on a grey horse at the one end, and at the other the company of grenadiers with their pope's hats. The pride of life seemed to mount into my brain at the sight of the red coats and the hearing of that merry music. A little farther on, and I was told I was in Crayman Parish, and began to substitute in my inquiries the name of the House of Shaws. It was a word that seemed to surprise those of whom I sought my way. At first I thought the plainness of my appearance in my country habit and that all dusty from the road consorted ill with the greatness of the place to which I was bound. But after two, or maybe three, had given me the same look and the same answer, I began to take it in my head there was something strange about the Shaws itself. The better to set this fear at rest, I changed the form of my inquiries and spying an honest fellow coming along a lane on the shaft of his cart, I asked him if he had ever heard tell of a house they called the House of Shaws. He stopped his cart and looked at me, like the others. I, said he, 
What for? It's a great house? I asked. Doubtless, says he. The house is a big, muckle house. I said I, but the folk that are in it? Folk, cried he. Are ye daft? There's nae folk there to call folk. What, say I, not Mr. Ebenezer? Oh, I, says the man, there's the laird, to be sure, if it's any room wanting. What'll well, like be your business, Manny? I was led to think that I would get a situation, I said, looking as modest as I could. What, cries the carter, in so sharp a note that his very horse started, and then, well, Manny, he added, it's not any of my affairs, but ye seem a decent spoken lad, and if ye'll take a word from me, ye'll keep clear of the shaws. The next person I came across was a dapper little man in a beautiful white wig, whom I saw to be a barber on his rounds, and knowing well that barbers were great gossips, I asked him plainly what sort of a man was Mr. Balfour of the Shaws. Hoot, 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 said the barber, nay kind of a man, nay kind of a man at all, and began to ask me very shrewdly what my business was, but I was more than a match for him at that, and he went on to his next customer no wiser than he came. I cannot well describe the blow this dealt to my illusions. The more indistinct the accusations were, the less I liked them, for they left the wider field to fancy. What kind of a great house was this, that all the parish should start and stare to be asked the way to it? Or what sort of a gentleman, that his ill fame should be thus current on the wayside? If an hour's walking would have brought me back to Ascendian, I had left my adventure then and there, and returned to Mr. Campbell's. But when I had come so far away already, mere shame would not suffer me to desist till I had put the matter to the touch of proof. I was bound, out of mere self-respect, to carry it through, and little as I liked the sound of what I heard, and slow as I began to travel, I still kept asking my way and still kept advancing. It was drawing on to sundown when I met a stout, dark, sour-looking woman coming trudging down a hill, and she, why I had put my usual question, turned sharp about, accompanied me back to the summit she had just left, and pointed to a great bulk of building standing very bare upon a green in the bottom of the next valley. The country was pleasant roundabout, running in low hills, pleasantly watered and wooded, and the crops, to my eyes, wonderfully good, but the house itself appeared to be a kind of ruin, no road led up to it, no smoke arose from any of the chimneys, nor was there any semblance of a garden. My heart sank. That. I cried. The woman's face lit up with a malignant anger. That is the house of Shaw's, she cried. Blood built it. Blood stopped the building of it. Blood shall bring it down. See here, she cried again dash, I spit upon the ground and crack my thumb at it. Black be its fall. If ye see the laird, tell him what ye hear. Tell him this makes the twelve hundred and nineteen time that Janet Clouston has called down the curse on him and his house, buyer and stable, man, guest, and master, wife, miss, or barren black, black be their fall. And the woman, whose voice had risen to a kind of eldritch sing-song, turned with a skip, and was gone. I stood where she left me, with my hair on end. In those days folk still believed in witches and trembled at a curse, and this one, falling so pat, like a wayside omen, to arrest me ere I carried out my purpose, took the pith out of my legs. I sat me down and stared at the house of Shaw's. The more I looked, the pleasanter that countryside appeared, being all set with hawthorn bushes full of flowers, the fields dotted with sheep, a fine flight of rooks in the sky, and every sign of a kind soil and climate, and yet the baroque in the midst of it went sore against my fancy. Country folk went by from the fields as I sat there on the side of the ditch, 
but I lacked the spirit to give them a good end. At last the sun went down, and then, right up against the yellow sky, I saw a scroll of smoke go mounting, not much thicker, as it seemed to me, than the smoke of a candle, but still there it was, and then a fire, and warmth, and cookery, and some living inhabitant that must have lit it, and this comforted my heart. So I set forward by a little faint track in the grass that led in my direction. It was very faint indeed to be the only way to a place of habitation, yet I saw no other. Presently it brought me to stone uprights, with an unmoved lodge beside them, and coats of arms upon the top. A main entrance it was plainly meant to be, but never finished, instead of gates of wrought iron, a pair of hurdles were tied across with a straw rope, and as there were no park walls, nor any sign of avenue, the track that I was following passed on the right hand of the pillars, and went wandering on toward the house. The nearer I got to that, the drearier it appeared. It seemed like the one wing of a house that had never been finished. What should have been the inner end stood open on the upper floors, and showed against the sky with steps and stairs of uncompleted masonry. Many of the windows were unglazed, and bats flew in and out like doves out of a dovecoat. The night had begun to fall as I got close, and in three of the lower windows, which were very high up and narrow and well barred, the changing light of a little fire began to glimmer. Was this the palace I had been coming to? Was it within these walls that I was to seek new friends and begin great fortunes? Why, in my father's house on Essen Waterside, the fire and the bright lights would show a mile away, and the door open to a beggar's knock? I came forward cautiously, and giving ear as I came, heard someone rattling with dishes, and a little dry, eager cough that came in fits, but there was no sound of speech, and not a dog barked. The door, as well as I could see it in the dim light, was a great piece of wood all studded with nails, and I lifted my hand with a faint heart under my jacket and knocked once. Then I stood and waited. The house had fallen into a dead silence, a whole minute passed away, and nothing stirred but the bats overhead. I knocked again and hearkened again. By this time my ears had grown so accustomed to the quiet that I could hear the ticking of the clock inside as it slowly counted out the seconds, but whoever was in that house kept deadly still and must have held his breath. I was in two minds whether to run away, but anger got the upper hand, and I began instead to rain kicks and buffets on the door and to shout out aloud for Mr. Balfour. I was in full career. When I heard the cough right overhead, and jumping back and looking up, beheld a man's head in a tall nightcap and the bell mouth of a blunderbuss at one of the first story windows. It's loaded, said a voice. I have come here with a letter, I said, to Mr. Ebenezer Balfour of Shaw's. Is he here? From whom is it? asked the man with the blunderbuss. That is neither here nor there, said I, for I was growing very wroth. Well, was the reply, ye can put it down upon the doorstep, and be off with ye. I will do no such thing, I cried. I will deliver it into Mr. Balfour's hands, as it was meant I should. It is a letter of introduction. A what? cried the voice, sharply. I repeated what I had said. Who are ye, yourself, was the next question after a considerable pause. I am not ashamed of my name, said I, they call me David Balfour. At that, I made sure the man started, for I heard the blunderbuss rattle on the windowsill, and it was after quite a long pause, and with a curious change of voice, that the next question followed. Is your father dead? I was so much surprised at this that I could find no voice to answer, but stood staring. I, the man resumed, he'll be dead, no doubt, 
and that'll be what brings you chapping to my door. Another pause, and then defiantly, well, man, he said, I'll let you in, and he disappeared from the window. Chapter 3 I make acquaintance of my uncle. Presently there came a great rally of chains and bolts, and the door was cautiously opened and shut to again behind me as soon as I had passed. Go into the kitchen and touch nothing, said the voice, and while the person of the house set himself to replacing the defenses of the door, I groped my way forward and entered the kitchen. The fire had burned up fairly bright and showed me the barest room I think I ever put my eyes on. Half a dozen dishes stood upon the shelves. The table was laid for supper with a bowl of porridge, a horn spoon, and a cup of small beer. Besides what I have named, there was not another thing in that great, stone vaulted, empty chamber but lockfast chests arranged along the wall in a corner covered with a padlock. As soon as the last chain was up, the man rejoined me. He was a mean, stooping, narrow-shouldered, clay-faced creature, and his age might have been anything between fifty and seventy. His nightcap was a flannel, and so was the nightgown that he wore, instead of coat and waistcoat, over his ragged shirt. He was long unshaved, but what most distressed and even daunted me, he would neither take his eyes away from me nor look me fairly in the face. What he was, whether by trade or birth, was more than I could fathom, but he seemed most like an old and profitable serving man who should have been left in charge of that big house upon board wages. Are ye sharp set? he asked, glancing at about the level of my knee. Ye can eat that drop porridge? I said I feared it was his own supper. Oh, said he, I can do fine wanting it. I'll take the ale, though, for it slackens my cough. He drank the cup about half out, still keeping an eye upon me as he drank, and then suddenly held out his hand. Let's see the letter, said he. I told him the letter was for Mr. Balfour, not for him. And who do you think I am, says he. Give me Alexander's letter. You know my father's name? It would be strange if I did me, he returned, for he was my born brother, and little as he seemed to like either me or my house, or my good porridge, I'm your born uncle, Davy, my man, and you my born nephew. So give us the letter, and sit down and fill your kite. If I had been some years younger, what with shame, weariness, and disappointment, I believe I had burst into tears. As it was, I could find no words, neither black nor white, but handed him the letter and sat down to the porridge with as little appetite for meat as ever a young man had. Meanwhile, my uncle, stooping over the fire, turned the letter over and over in his hands. Do you ken what's in it? He asked, suddenly. You see for yourself, sir, said I, that the seal has not been broken. I said he, but what brought you here? To give the letter, said I. No, says he, cunningly, but you'll have had some hopes, no doubt. I confess, sir, said I, when I was told that I had kinsfolk well to do, I did indeed indulge the hope that they might help me in my life. But I am no beggar, I look for no favors at your hands, and I want none that are not freely given. For as poor as I appear, I have friends of my own that will be blind to help me. Who toot, said Uncle Ebenezer, didn't he fly up in the snuff at me? We'll agree fine yet. And, Davy, my man, if you're done with that bit porridge, I could just take a sup of it myself. I, he continued, as soon as he had ousted me from the stool and spoon, they're fine, hail some food they read grand food, porridge. He murmured a little grace to himself and fell to. Your father was very fond of his meat, I mind, he was a hearty, if not a great eater, 
but as for me, I could never do more than pike at food. He took a pull at the small beer, which probably reminded him of hospitable duties, for his next speech ran thus, if you read dry you'll find water behind the door. To this I returned no answer, standing stiffly on my two feet and looking down upon my uncle with a mighty angry heart. He, on his part, continued to eat like a man under some pressure of time and to throw out little darting glances now at my shoes and now at my homespun stockings. Once only, when he had ventured to look a little higher, our eyes met and no thief taken with a hand in a man's pocket could have shown more lively signals of distress. This set me in a muse, whether his timidity arose from too long a disuse of any human company, and whether perhaps, upon a little trial, it might pass off, and my uncle change into an altogether different man. From this I was awakened by his sharp voice. Your father's been long dead, he asked. Three weeks, sir, said I. He was a secret man, Alexander a secret, silent man, he continued. He never said muckle when he was young. He'll never have spoken muckle of me. I never knew, sir, till you told it me yourself, that he had any brother. Dear me, dear me, said Ebenezer. Nor yet of Shaw's, I dare say. Not so much as the name, sir, said I. To think o' oh, that, said he. A strange nature of a man. For all that, he seemed singularly satisfied, but whether with himself, or me, or with this conduct of my father's, was more than I could read. Certainly, however, he seemed to be outgrowing that distaste, or ill will, that he had conceived at first against my person, for presently he jumped up, came across the room behind me, and hit me a smack upon the shoulder. We'll agree fine yet, he cried. I'm just as glad I let you in. And now come out to your bed. To my surprise, he lit no lamp or candle, but set forth into the dark passage, groped his way, breathing deeply up a flight of steps, and paused before a door, which he unlocked. I was close upon his heels, having stumbled after him as best I might, and then he bade me go in, for that was my chamber. I did as he bid, but paused after a few steps, and begged a light to go to bed with. Poo toot, said Uncle Ebenezer, there's a fine moon. Neither moon nor star, sir, and pit murk, said I, I can't see the bed. Who toot, who toot, said he. Lights in a house is a thing I didn't agree with. I'm Uncle Fear of Fires. Good night to ye, Davy, my man. And before I had time to add a further protest, he pulled the door to, and I heard him lock me in from the outside. I did not know whether to laugh or cry. The room was as cold as a well, and the bed, when I had found my way to it, as damp as a peat hag, but by good fortune I had caught up my bundle and my plaid, and rolling myself in the ladder, I lay down upon the floor under lee of the big bedstead, and fell speedily asleep. With the first peep of day I opened my eyes, to find myself in a great chamber, hung with stamped leather, furnished with fine embroidered furniture, and lit by three fair windows. Ten years ago, or perhaps twenty, it must have been as pleasant a room to lie down or to awake in as a man could wish, but damp, dirt, disuse, and the mice and spiders had done their worst since then. Many of the window panes, besides, were broken, and indeed this was so common a feature in that house, that I believe my uncle must at some time have stood a siege from his indignant neighbors perhaps with Janet Clouston at their head. Meanwhile the sun was shining outside, and being very cold in that miserable room, I knocked and shouted till my jailer came and let me out. He carried me to the back of the house, where was a draw well, and told me to wash my face there, 
if I wanted, and when that was done, I made the best of my own way back to the kitchen where he had lit the fire and was making the porridge. The table was laid with two bowls and two horn spoons, but the same single measure of small beer. Perhaps my arrested on this particular with some surprise, and perhaps my uncle observed it, for he spoke up as if in answer to my thought, asking me if I would like to drink ale first, so he called it. I told him such was my habit, but not to put himself about. Nah, nah, said he, I'll deny you nothing in reason. He fetched another cup from the shelf, and then, to my great surprise, instead of drawing more beer, he poured an accurate half from one cup to the other. There was a kind of nobleness in this that took my breath away. If my uncle was certainly a miser, he was one of that thorough breed that goes near to make the vice respectable. When we had made an end of our meal, my uncle Ebenezer unlocked a drawer and drew out of it a clay pipe and a lump of tobacco from which he cut one fill before he locked it up again. Then he sat down in the sun at one of the windows and silently smoked. From time to time his eyes came coasting round to me and he shot out one of his questions. Once it was, and your mother, and I had told him that she, too, was dead, I, she was a bonnie lassie. Then, after another long pause, where were these friends o' oh, yours? I told him they were different gentlemen of the name of Campbell, though, indeed, there was only one, and that the minister that had ever taken the least note of me, but I began to think my uncle made too light of my position, and finding myself all alone with him, I did not wish him to suppose me helpless. He seemed to turn this over in his mind, and then, Davy, my man, said he, Evie come to the right bit when he came to your uncle Ebenezer. I've a great notion of the family, and I mean to do the right by you, but while I'm taking a bit thing to missile of what's the best thing to put you to whether the law, or the ministry, or maybe the army, Wilk is what boys are fondest of I wouldn't like the Balfers to be humbled before a wean healing Campbells, and I'll ask you to keep your tongue within your teeth. Nay letters, nay messages, no kind of word to anybody, or else there's my door. Uncle Ebenezer, said I, I've no manner of reason to suppose you mean anything but well by me. For all that, I would have you to know that I have a pride of my own. It was by no will of mine that I came seeking you, and if you show me your door again, I'll take you at the word. He seemed grievously put out. Hoots toots, said he, see a canny, man see a canny. By a day or two. I'm a warlock to find a fortune for you in the bottom of a porridge bowl, but just you give me a day or two and say nothing to nobody, and as sure as sure, I'll do the right by you. Very well, said I, enough said. If you want to help me, there's no doubt, but I'll be glad of it, and none, but I'll be grateful. It seemed to me, too soon, I dare say, that I was getting the upper hand of my uncle, and I began next to say that I must have the bed and bedclothes aired and put to sun dry, for nothing would make me sleep in such a pickle. Is this my house or yours? said he in his keen voice, and then all of a sudden broke off. Nah, nah, said he, I didn't mean that. What's mine is yours, Davy, my man, and what's yours is mine. Blood's thicker than water, and there's nobody but you and me that ought the name. And then on he rambled about the family and its ancient greatness, and his father that began to enlarge the house, and himself that stopped the building as a sinful waste, and this put it in my head to give him Janet Clouston's message. The limmer, he cried. Twelve hundred and fifteen that's every day since I had the limmer rope hit. D.O.D., David, I'll have her roasted on red peats before I'm by with it. A witch a proclaimed witch. I'll laugh and see the session clerk. And with that he opened a chest, 
and got a very old and well-preserved blue coat and waistcoat and a good enough beaver hat, both without lace. These he threw on anyway, and taking his staff from the cupboard, locked all up again and was for setting out when a thought arrested him. I can't leave you by your cell in the house, said he. I'll have to lock you out. The blood came to my face. If you lock me out, I said, it'll be the last you'll see of me in friendship. He turned very pale and sucked his mouth in. This is no the way, he said, looking wickedly at a corner of the floor dash. This is no the way to win my favor, David. Sir says I, with a proper reverence for your age and our common blood, I do not value your favor at a bottle's purchase. I was brought up to have a good conceit of myself, and if you were all the uncle and all the family I had in the world ten times over, I wouldn't buy your liking at such prices. Uncle Ebenezer went and looked out of the window for a while. I could see him all trembling and twitching like a man with palsy. But when he turned round, he had a smile upon his face. Well, well, said he, we must bear and forbear. I'll no go, that's all that's to be said of it. Uncle Ebenezer, I said, I can make nothing out of this. You use me like a thief, you hate to have me in this house, you let me see it every word and every minute, it's not possible that you can like me, and as for me, I've spoken to you as I never thought to speak to any man. Why do you seek to keep me, then? Let me gain back, let me gain back to the friends I have, and that like me. Nah, 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 he said very earnestly. I like you fine, will agree fine yet, and for the honor of the house I couldn't let you leave the way you came. Bide here quiet, there's a good lad. Just you bide here quite a bit, Ty, and you'll find that we agree. Well, sir, said I, after I had thought the matter out in silence, I'll stay a while. It's more just I should be helped by my own blood than strangers, and if we don't agree, I'll do my best it shall be through no fault of mine.